This paper explores the many uses to which Henry James has been put by online satire and meme culture. With Anand de Michael Inesco's recent analysis of the many generations of appropriations of James's cultural capital, I apply it to the context of digital culture. I categorize Jamesian apparitions in online media to discover what about James is considered viral. That is, what it is about his texts and his contemporary legacy that constitutes ideal material for memes. Somewhat predictably, general interest sites like The Onion reflect a vein of anti-intellectualism. One horoscope advises, at the middle of your screen, though you believe otherwise, it is not healthy to prefer the novels of Henry James to actual human contact. And one of The Onion's technology hype pieces, stunning E3 announcement reveals new video game consoles to phase out graphics entirely, imagines that, at the bottom of your screen, the most highly anticipated graphics-free game of 2014 is undoubtedly Bethesda Studios' text-based adaptation of Henry James's 1881 novel, The Portrait of a Lady. For Dave Eggers's tongue-in-cheek digital literary magazine McSweeney's, in one of their series of satirical sestinas, James becomes just one in a list of canonical authors to flout. As you'll see in the rest of my examples, James here is useful as a shock tactic. He gives an unexpected prelude to something crass, tacky, depraved, or just unspeakably blunt. Or more seriously, in the article Dispatches from Adjunct Faculty at a Large State University, James becomes a placeholder for whatever type of art does not feature, quote, big actions, like, say, Bruce Willis running across broken glass in his bare feet. But note how the focus here is on James's ability to provide insight on human suffering, empathizing with James and his characters rather than with Michael Bay, Ridley Scott, or Eli Roth, means empathizing with lonely adjuncts who will always lose the girl, commenting obliquely on the changing nature of university employment and its human costs. My next category of James viral media includes student-created image macros. Image macros, which you know as memes, the most important of which are of course the lolcats, are captioned images using text speak, made to be easily remixable and shared. Their visual signature of simple ugliness derives from the house style of the cult online image board and community 4chan. For me, though, it indicates a new aesthetic that rejects an airbrushed, corporate-branded smoothness in favor of a hackerish, barely-formatted, cut-and-paste cheap simplicity. Websites like memegenerator.net have proliferated, allowing any user to create memes quite quickly. Student-produced Henry James memes made on this site include instances of the Why You Know Guy and the English major Armadillo. Why You Know Guy expresses frustration and anger at someone else's behavior. This anonymous student's instance of Why You Know Guy seems particularly angry, as one of the few unofficial rules for these image macros is to keep the text minimal and as clear of the image as possible. The English major Armadillo is similarly attitudinal. This particular instance recreates familiar tensions between liberal arts majors and their peers in STEM or in business. In fact, both the James Why You Know Guy and English Major Armadillo police boundaries between real English majors and their apparently less serious peers. For in these cases, taking James seriously becomes a token of one's superior learnedness. The modern English major must understand James and second, must know how to express their enjoyment of him humorously in viral form. Suggesting that many James memes, far from merely reiterating tired cliches, engage in practices of self-referentiality and symbolic play that are present in James' texts themselves. Even more intriguingly, many of these techniques were absorbed by meme makers during their English classes, or when they were reading Henry James' texts if we go by why you know guy in English major armadillo. This suggests to me that making visual culture or satire seems to be an appropriate way to react to James in the 21st century, rather than, say, writing a book review. The same intentionally shocking vulgarity of the McSweeney's pieces are evident in these memes as well. I appreciate James, 
this visual rhetoric indicates, but I'm also cool. Superficially, it might seem that the distance between the winking vulgarity of these digital productions and James's reputation for indirection and discretion is an indication that liking James does not necessarily entail inheriting his putative conservatism. Meaning your love of James is akin to putting on a leather jacket before breaking out your sweet first American edition of the portrait of a lady on a cafe patio. But these pieces also recognize that there's not really any such distance at all. Linking James to sex, violence, and insouciance is a testament not to their rejection of James, but of their superior interpretation of his texts, of having been readers on whom nothing is lost, for they are sharp enough to read between the lines of indirection and discretion in his fiction. Two categories of digital James satire in particular transcend cliches about his difficulty. These are self-consciously literary sites and feminist satire sites. The feminist sites often agree with feminist critics who praise James's portrayal of women. Bustle's 10 of the most stylish literary heroines of the 20th century first singles out Henry James as a fabulous literary dressmaker. This listicle praises Millie Teal's nonconformist style in a roundup of literature's fashionistas. Here we find the same oppositional tone that we found in the image macros. The author here praises Millie for being more somber, more adult than her peers. If digital fans of James simplify their reactions to his works when they translate his works to online satire, it doesn't mean they therefore reject the moral, aesthetic, and intellectual hierarchies delineated by his texts. Even when these sites find something lacking in James, they also posit that a solution can be generated from within Jamesian texts by reading them through the production of digital satire. Of course, these solutions look very different from one another. Kate Beaton's webcomic, Hark a Vagrant, for example, literalizes the silences in What Maisie Knew. The thickly scribbled bars over the dialogue reproduce the sense that it is the author who censors. Maisie's expression assures us that she knows something sinister is going on, though the literal meaning has been shielded from her. Yet it also leaves open the possibility that the censorship has happened after the fact, after Maisie has known. If that is true, both the truth and Maisie's full knowledge of it have been censored, obliterated from our gaze. Presumably Beaton has written, then scribbled out, the unexpurgated text, thereby placing readers of her comic into Maisie's position and Beaton into James's own. This equivocation, I would argue, amounts to a fairly sophisticated understanding of what Maisie knew. Unlike some of the other memes we have seen, it preserves the text's ambiguity. Taking the opposite approach of Hark a Vagrant, the Paris Review completes the ambassadors with not-safe-for-work deleted scenes. A 12-part piece, this very much not-safe-for-work piece, uncannily supplies all too persuasive pornographic interludes. Let's look at the comments section. It's quite illuminating. Respondents divide among those who are disgusted, those who are highly amused, and those who protest that though they are not prudes, it is a travesty of James's style. A final commenter on your screen. How boring these clever people are. Maybe the most illuminating of all, but it's the latter group, the stylistic detractors, that I find most interesting. Both Hark a Vagrant and the Paris Review are reproducing the same process that a reader goes through of interpolating a novel's implicit content. It is a second layer of reading. First, the author reads the James novel, and then they use digital memes, digital forms, digital platforms to read it again and produce a reading for other readers. So by the time we get to it, there's three levels of reading going on. But to get back to the Paris Review, Perhaps it's less the vulgarity of using four-letter words that truly offends the readers of the Paris Review than the implication that we readers desire a translator not being able to support or supply the subtext ourselves. That in a post Fifty Shades Grey world, uh, that in a post Fifty Shades of Grey world, we tolerate no subtext, only text. James's own alleged sexlessness thus becomes the reader's own, and that's what is intolerable. Those who enjoy pornographic translations of the ambassadors are not so much called out for their lechery as for their subpar reading comprehension. 
in their lack of appreciation for James's style. Ultimately, then, it is not James's lack of appeal in the digital age that is posited when McSweeney's recommends adding an exclamation point to jazz up the Henry James review. What is posited here is our own apparent seriousness as critics, but so is the implication that we're not completely irredeemable. James readers are thus not to be insulted, precisely, when McSweeney's winkingly demands that finishing school graduates display Henry James and Emily Post equally on their shelves. Seen in the middle of your screen. The joke is on those who don't get the illusion, on the people who reduce James to a signifier of gentility. Many of these satires, satirists even express a desire to be stuck in a James novel, like McSweeney's well-read escort who loves Dublin largely because the characters speak like James' characters. An advisor to modern-day Daisy Millers, she recommends Dublin when a lady has money and wants to party. James' illusions serve her as a talisman to ward off judgments regarding her choice of profession. They prove that she is worthy of Connor with his four university degrees. On the beloved feminist satire site The Toast, Ariel Zybrak also desires to be stuck in a James novel. This listicle breaks down characteristic James plots and characters, showing her skill and depth of reading to the degree that she renders his works shockingly simple. It's worth showing each one of these in turn, as much of the pleasure in the piece comes from the frisson of sudden recognition. We are invited to select our Jamesian fate, identifying with them easily through Zybrak's talent for finding the essence of a plot. For some of the other viral texts we've looked at, the punchline is something like, gee whiz, isn't it hard to read Henry James? Followed by a judgment, either of those who do understand James, or those who don't. But this is a virtuosic reading performance. Ambiguity, snobbery, materialism, and marital drama combine in each item of this listicle, adding up to what's not a terribly inaccurate summary of how in James's works, personal identities and desires are compromised, yet clarified, as individuals navigate particular social networks, leading to moments of profound personal crisis that are all but invisible to those around them. I argue that a deep need for Jamesian modes of representation is behind these digital afterlives. The glib tropes, the affectionate caricatures, are not just jockeyings for cultural capital, Rather, they mask how these online satirists are as desperate for knowledge as Maggie Verver. Only, the satirists build humor by embedding the complexities and ambiguities of a James novel inside the obviousness and iterative complacencies of internet forms. Sure, you could say that the meme's precocity is shallow, short-circuited, played for cheap laughs, like much of my presentation here. But it's showing knowingness often matures, in the cases we've examined, into a pleasurable, not simple engagement in meta-discourse, a kind of epistemological brinksmanship that James himself would not find wholly alien. Turning again to the toast will help us tease out the gender politics that underlay the mocking, tongue-in-cheek approach that negate James but preserve him at a higher level to adapt Hegel. Just as Bustle's fashion ranking of 20th century literature fashionistas mentions Edith Wharton, and just as the illustration for how to tell if you're in a James novel actually illustrated Gillian Anderson playing Wharton's Lily Bart, an article from The Toast emphasizes the inseparability of James and Wharton in the minds of educated, digitally-minded young women in the early 21st century. This article mimes Edith Wharton as she critiques Starbucks but approves of the phosphates I enjoyed in my motor travels with Henry James. James here functions quite simply as a celebrity sighting, as Wharton's canny name-dropping. But it's quite profound if you think about the audience of this piece. It looks forward to a time when TripAdvisor reviews by the Toast's readers will, in hindsight, will have seen to have displayed an urbanity similar to Wharton's. More directly, though, this name-dropping centers Wharton by decentering James. James is invoked, he's taken for granted as a given, not discussed in and of himself. He is an excuse, a pretext. He's invoked as a marker of quality, then he's quickly left behind in an iterated feminist act of decentering. This often happens when scholars take to public writing in these digital venues. Anne Boyd Rieu, University of New Orleans professor and biographer of Constance Fenimer Wilson, 
has been leveraging the toast's popularity with young women by using viral satire as what we might call pedagogy if it's in the classroom, but outside of it can call it public outreach. On the toast, she brings her readers, who are fond of Jane Eyre and Little Women, some ideas for further reading for other unrecovered women's classics of the Bildungsroman genre. Anne, Wilson's bestseller, which outsold James's The Portrait of Lady by a factor of ten, is here recommended for being comparable to James. In a similarly structured piece, Ryu debunks familiar James stories to educate her, her reader about Wilson. We might turn instead to Ryu's scholarly blog, The Blue Stocking Bulletin, or to her excellent new biography of Wilson to learn this kind of thing. But public outreach is so crucial, I think, for feminist recovery projects to go beyond the scholarly community in the 21st century. Other pieces on the toast are more baldly oppositional, way beyond Ryu's patient correction of historical gaps. James's letters and opinions are quoted for optimal outrage over and over, allowing the author to save women from the past from James's censure. One Link Roundup quotes his bon mot that Isabella Stewart Gardner is not a woman, she's a locomotive with a Pullman car attached. Another article quotes that he dismisses the circle around African-American sculptor Edmonia Lewis as the white marmorian flock. These gems provide irresistible calls to action for women writers who are creating an entertaining body of pop scholarship. For a 19th century female artist to have been dissed by James is the ultimate marker of unsung skill and sophistication. Likewise, for a contemporary satirist, to diss James is to chip away at the misogyny of viral internet culture. The outrage culture that so many people think we live in is in this context fairly productive. Of course, you might think that this impulse to scapegoat James is not entirely dissimilar to the suffragette who knifed John Singer Sargent's portrait of James because he looked establishment. But think about how close to scholarship this work is. It engages with letters, notebooks, fiction, nonfiction. It digs into the archives for neglected art and artists. And pay attention to the playful, often affectionate, rather than vicious tone that these feminist satire sites use. By contrast, the more masculine takeoffs in McSweeney's and The Onion tend to be far more, I think, condemnatory and cynical. The feminist satire, such as um, Ryu's work uh, and Kate Beaton's work, as well as the image macros we've recently examined, they rely on the same foundational literary values that drive us to read James in the first place. Of course, The Toast is the same site that helpfully glosses the modern library's top 100 novels according to whether they appeal to jocks or nerds. You'll probably not be surprised to learn that number 26, The Wings of the Dove, and number 27, The Ambassadors, are for nerds rather than for jocks. Number 32, The Golden Bowl, is as yet unglossed, although I'm fairly sure we can guess where this is going. It's important to remember that nerd here is an honorific, this is one moment when the oppositional politics of the toast shifts to enfold James into its own flock, resembling the why you know guy in the English major armadillo. Where the rubber meets the road, literary types stick together, even if James is on record to have been catty to female artists. So while we might deplore the caricature that positions James as a remote, stuffy god of American literature, the authors of such viral satire are always generous, always willing to admit that they like his writing. But most importantly, this function of James to prompt feminist satire is what I find interesting and remarkable. James becomes the ultimate gadfly, but in being so reduced, he remains a major touchstone. And a fun one. It radiates and provokes a delicious highbrow bitchiness that gratifies the highly literate lady after work. Unfortunately, the toast is shuddering soon due to the impossibility of managing the finances of such a site in an era of declining ad revenue. But even if the toast must close, other sites flaunt a similar relationship to James, and more image macros will certainly continue to provide a convenient template for how to read James. Just as The Onion and McSweeney's will undoubtedly continue to feature Jamesian content, whether we kind of like where it's going or not. During a conversation with John Carlos Rowe last April, I listened to him exhorting me, by way of a stirring, shrathered a little Billum speech that I can't help but think he's given a few times before. 
Its essential message was that my generation has the responsibility to keep the torch burning, doing our best to keep people reading Henry James, to keep him in print. When I wrote this abstract, I imagined my job to be showing you how he's very much alive in the visual culture and rhetorical figures through which James circulates online. But now I wonder if it's more important to move outward, to interact with this public community interested in James. What they need from us is our critique of the master narrative of James that they so often invoke. Our new James, as a result of the scholarship of the last 30 years, is a new one, a queer James, a postmodern James, a global James. Figuring out how to communicate this James to this generation of digital cultural producers, that's where I hope to go next. <laughs>